Good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight for a very special webinar. We're celebrating National Women's Health Week. I'm Varun Sriram with Generation UCAN, and I am certainly not the main event today. We've got a fantastic panel um, from a really a wide variety of fields joining us today. Um, we've got Dr. Kathy Yeckel, metabolism researcher, for, a researcher, excuse me, from Yale University. We've got Sports dietitian Dina Griffin, she's out in Colorado, um, uh, an endurance athlete herself, works with a, a wide range of athletes. And we've also got, last but certainly not least, uh, Julie Cully, a uh, former Olympian um, from 2012 and uh, an elite runner. She's trains for the marathon, the 5K, the 10K. She's kind of done it all. So um, we're really going to have a, a fantastic discussion tonight uh, talking about a variety of topics specific to women's health and fitness. Um, before we really get into the meat of our discussion, I'd just like to give our panel a chance to introduce themselves. And uh, Julie, I'll start with you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, let the folks in attendance know a little bit about who you are. Hi, folks in attendance. Um, my name is Julie Cully. Thank you, Varn, for the introduction. Um, I am a 2012 Olympian in the 5,000 meters and continue to train for A6 and Jen Yukan, um, and I'm also a Division One collegiate coach and have kind of intermixed coaching um, in the last 10 years of my life as, uh, as a part of my training regimen and as a part of spreading the good word uh, among female athletes and, and uh, trying to empower women to take the next step in their lives. So um, I'll be kind of coming from that angle this evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Julie. And uh, Dina, uh, sports dietitian Dina Griffin. Dina, how are you doing tonight? Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Varun. I'm doing great. Yeah, I work out of Colorado as a practicing sport dietitian. And as you mentioned, I work with um, all kinds of individuals from recreational to competitive to elite um, endurance athletes primarily of all ages. So men, women, um, the whole gamut. And I, as you mentioned too, I'm also an endurance athlete myself, doing mostly ultra running these past couple of years. Um, but I've dabbled in the long course triathlon as well. Fantastic, Dina. So you're going to give us a, a really a, a fascinating perspective um, from the, the um, information you've gathered from working with uh, a number of um, different types of athletes, um, both in the field and in the lab. Um, and finally, uh, Dr. Kathy Echo. Um, Metabolism researcher at Yale University. Uh, Kathy, how are you doing tonight? Thank you for joining us as well. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Varun, and thanks for everybody for attending. And I have. I have the great pleasure of sort of backing up Dina and Julie um, this evening with any kind of research evidence. And there's a lot of new great um, research that's being done on women specifically with metabolism and exercise physiology and so hopefully I can sort of fill in some of the gaps between some of the practical and what we might know as being more consistent. For me I've worked with everything from obese kids all the way to elderly little old ladies to you know the, the athletes both running and cycling mostly. Um, I'm a runner myself um, and it's great to be here and to sort of help drive this whole conversation. Well, Kathy, let's um, let's get right into it and, and start with you, and um, you know, start specifically with some of the uh, the areas where you've spent a lot of time um, in terms of the research, and that is the uh, the human metabolism, and specifically uh, the metabolism for women. Certainly, um, you know, we're all generally aware that that men and women um, physiologically aren't the same. We're, we're wired differently, built differently. Um, from a metabolic standpoint, what is one of the key or, or a few of the key and primary differences between uh, a women's metabolism versus a men's? Okay, that's a that's a great way for us to start, I think, tonight. And some of the, the, the real key differences is that for pretty much every sport that you do, for every activity, the guys, unfortunately, are just hands down beating us in terms of the amount of calories that they expend. So I don't think they've tried croquet yet, but maybe we would do it with croquet. <laughs> but every like real sport, <laughs> um, we're, we come up a little bit short. And the reason why that's so important is because it, it makes us put calories in perspective. We have to really, really focus on the fact that when we eat, calories have to count. Even if we're really exercising a lot, we have to think about eating really well so that we can support the activity. 
I think the other really big key difference is that women, you know, uh, are really good at burning fat during exercise. So we have to pay close attention to the fact that that's our secret weapon. And if we don't want to blow it um, and we want to use that to its fullest, we have to really think about, well, what are we eating around the time we're exercising? What are we eating normally in our diets? What, you know, how, how are we approaching the exercise to still have enough muscle glycogen there to do real power stuff, but to also really not lose our secret weapon. And I think finally, from all that whole perspective is the fact that Unlike men, we don't burn a lot of fat after exercise. We used to, you know, it used to be that, that we thought, okay, you exercise, and then, oh, you have this wonderful hours and hours and hours of fat burning after exercise. And unfortunately, women, we are really, really metabolically efficient, and we come right back down to resting levels unless we've been careful about our strategies for exercise. And so it, it really points to the fact that, you know, we burn fat really well during exercise. But the rest of the time, even the fat that we eat, we don't burn as much of the fat that the men can eat, can um, burn when they eat the same amount of fat. So it's, those are some of the real big differences. Hopefully that wasn't too many things right at once. No, that was great, Kathy. And, and you know, you, one of the things you mentioned, um, this, this idea of, of being metabolically efficient, uh, Dina, if I could uh, uh, switch it to you for a minute, um, this term metabolic efficiency that Kathy mentioned, it's, it's really at the core um, of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So before I want to ask you what I'm going to ask you, in, in your own words, what is metabolic efficiency? You know, to be metabolically efficient, what does that mean? Yeah, so in a few simple sentences, hopefully, um, we can explain it such that um, what, what we're doing is looking at how well the body can utilize or burn its own energy sources, primarily how well we can use fat as an energy source, not only during exercise, but, but even at rest. And then looking at that other primary energy source, which is carbohydrate or glycogen, how well we preserve that particular fuel source, because it's very limited in contrast to our fat stores. So in a nutshell, how well do we burn fat versus how well can we preserve carbohydrates? So you've studied, you know, a, a, a wide range of athletes and you've worked to make athletes uh, more metabolically efficient. When you work with female athletes uh, in general, does your approach differ? And, and overall, what is your approach when you're trying to make uh, an athlete um, and specifically a female athlete more metabolically efficient? I know it's a loaded question because, it, you know, we're all individuals and so um, we have different um, life cycle stages. We have different challenges in terms of just our lifestyle, our eating preferences, the type of athlete we, we are, if it's a recreational or, you know, fairly competitive athlete. Um, so you have to kind of weigh all of those aspects. Um, nonetheless, there is a bottom line to looking at daily food choices and those those daily meals and snacks. And so what we want to do, especially with women, and to Kathy's point, that, that women may not burn as much fat after exercise, we know we really have to optimize our, our meals and try to put together foods that, that do stabilize blood sugar very well so that we're not getting, you know, the blood sugar highs and lows to further aggravate or um, make that uh, lack of fat burning prolonged. Kathy, um, this term that Dina just identified, blood sugar, and, and she just mentioned blood sugar highs and lows, uh, it's certainly something that's going to be at the core of so many things we're going to discuss here over the next, uh, you know, 40 to 50 minutes. Um, what, you know, coming from my perspective, and, and I don't know how many people in the audience today echo this, uh, before I really um, you know, learned more about nutrition and got involved um, in, in this whole nutrition world, you know, blood sugar was a term that I heard, um, you know, most commonly associated with people who had diabetes. And, and you know, for, for the general public, there might be some thought that if I don't have diabetes, I don't have to worry about uh, managing my blood sugar, or keeping my blood sugar steady. Um, that's certainly not the case. It's something everybody wants to, to worry about managing. But what is, um, you know, the, the impact of, of keeping, I guess, why should people care about keeping their blood sugar steady? 
Well, I think for for women, there's a couple of reasons. And let's before we even get into that, let's let's throw out the opposite side because we've been talking about fat burning and we brought up carbohydrate burning. But what, some of the most recent research is suggesting that although men you know, and this has even been done now in the Ironman, although men can really benefit from carbohydrate during exercise, taking it in, like in terms of simple carbohydrate, women don't seem to have the same benefit at all. So in reality, th th we have to change strategies completely and cause, because what we want then is we want to make sure we can keep our blood sugar stable so that, that we can keep burning fat for as long as possible. And so one of the things about stability with blood sugar and why we should care is there's a couple of, of ways that we should care about it. During exercise, it's a clear case of fatigue. You can, if you can keep your blood sugar stable, you're much, 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 much less likely to become fatigued. If, if you have big swings, if you've just taken in a, 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 a big dose of simple carbohydrate before you exercise, what ends up happening is, is that you have, it's the natural response to have that hormone insulin be secreted, which means that all your fat's going to stop releasing fatty acids to burn because all of a sudden it's concentrated on burning carbohydrate. So that magic weapon we have of turning burning fat, that will go away. We will burn carbohydrate just like the men in terms of the plasma carbohydrate. But we just, but, but I want to be clear that basically we don't have the same performance benefits. And that's, that's starting to be shown in a number of studies now that, that it's, so for us, it's all about keeping carbohydrate in the blood. Blood sugar is very nice and stable. So, Kathy, one one thing that you you said uh, you, and you reiterated there again at the end um, that's that's fascinating is that women don't have the same benefit uh, as men of taking in simple carbohydrate during exercise. And Julia, uh, you know, I want uh, to take your perspective on this because you know, for you, I'm sure you know you've been in the running world uh, now for you know many years, and um, that statement that that Kathy just made, I mean, how counter. Um, does that run to what you were taught coming up as a runner, um, you know, in terms of what you needed uh, to support your training uh, and, and, you know, specifically when we're talking about simple carbohydrate intake during exercise? Yes, I mean, it's, it's actually really interesting. And um, obviously we've been paying attention to, to the new research and things that are coming out over time. But, you know, you, you think about um, – uh, the general population and what they're looking at when it comes to stepping on the line the next day. I mean, we've all talked about carbo loading, right? And and <laughs> listening to this conversation just further um, affirmates that carbo loading may not be the most uh, efficient way of um, preparing for performance or preparing for a workout or just preparing for a sustained effort. So, um, you know, I think that Anyone who's ever really experienced a um, a, a crash um, with their blood sugar really has an idea of the difference between, you know, when you're properly hydrated or when you're properly um, nourished to be able to counter that kind of um, or at least prevent that kind of situation from happening, the differences in your ability to get the most out of yourself. So. Um, when you're looking at it from that angle, I mean, it's incredible the differences, and, and, and we have to, I guess, be kind of at the forefront of, of um, taking the research that's out there that, uh, you know, Kathy and Dean are, are, are looking into and, and um, finding so much uh, relevant research about and how we can then apply it to the way we speak to the athletes, the way we speak to the general population about, about how that really does make a difference um, and, and kind of go against some of those um, generic ideas of, of, of hydration and nutrition um, leading up to a big race. So, Julie, you've certainly played around, um, you know, like I'm sure most uh, people who are runners or endurance athletes, you've certainly um, used simple uh, sugars or simple carbohydrates during your training. And, um, and, you know, there may still be a place for you for that. But what was the reason that you moved away from that um, as your primary method of fueling yourself during training? Yeah, I mean, um, the reason I found Varin and the reason I found Duration You Can, and obviously Varin knows the story, is um, I, you know, started to bump up in distance. And I think, and maybe the, the other ladies on the panel can speak to this, but 
you know, when you're younger, I think maybe you do have the ability to um, kind of push through a little bit longer. Um, you know, in, in some of these long runs or workouts or sustained efforts, but um, in the last five years or so, and I'm 33 years old, um, I started to find that, you know, I would get out on the 15, 15, 17, 18 mile runs and the last couple miles I would really start to struggle. And, um, you know, <laughs> I thought that if I took a goo with me out on a run, that that was going to make um, a big difference. And I would just take that later and I would be able to kind of sustain that effort all the way through. But I was really struggling with, um, being able to make it to the end of the run. And, you know, we're trained as athletes to think that, oh, that just means you're not tough enough or uh, you just need to be more, uh, have more mental acuity at the end of a, of a sustained effort or a, a longer workout. And um, it wasn't until I actually spoke with someone from Gen Ucan, um, who's a friend of mine, that he kind of taught me the differences. Um, and, the first time I used Gen you Can, I was actually just shocked. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a plug for Gen you Can, but um, I immediately saw the difference um, by sustaining my blood sugar levels and um, started looking more seriously about the way that food was affecting the way I was performing. And when I really started to make changes and make differences in that, it really changed the way I was able to, to get more out of myself. Um, so it's, it's definitely been a, a big game changer for me. It's a great perspective, Julie. And I, and I realize everybody that's with us, um, on the webinar may, uh, or may not exa be entirely familiar with, with UCAN, which Julie referenced, uh, a couple times. And we, we will get uh, a little deeper into th that, um, towards the end of this, um, in a nutshell, just so you're all, um, kind of, uh, aware of, of what, um, she's saying, you know, the, the, one of the main, um, I guess the main way that you can works and, and what's so unique about it is that it is a, a slow releasing carbohydrate. So it's designed to keep that blood sugar uh, and, and that energy very steady uh, for a long period of time. So, uh, you know, Kathy said it at the end of her last statement, but steady blood sugar, um, you know, can be equated to steady energy uh, or can be equated, you know, to less fatigue. And, and, you know, anecdotally, that's really what Julie is sharing um, that she felt by, by keeping her blood sugar nice and steady during her workouts. But Kathy, I want to um, go back to a point that you raised. Um, when you said women don't have the same benefit from taking in simple carbs during exercise, can you define um, what you mean by benefit? I mean, why are most people um, taking in simple carbs during exercise? What are they looking for? And, and you know, what is it that um, might either not be beneficial to women or, or may even be detrimental to women from doing that? Well, the, these, this was research that was really look. well, there was two, there's been two things that have been very striking. One, they did a sort of a lead in diet all the way up to the recommended amount of carbohydrate. And so it was, could, if you have, if you have carbohydrate on board, right, if you have sufficient, if you have different amounts of carbohydrate on board, can you show per, improved performance? Because basically in the men, the literature in the men, there's improved performance when you have it. So it's, it's a, you know, the ability to, to the time to exhaustion or, or the speed at which they can do a time trial or real performance measures. And there's been a lot of mixed um, data in, in women. So it, it's just been assumed that of course, and, and if you give women, and I'm not saying if you, I, I'm not trying to make the point that if you were to give carbohydrate to women, you will, we will burn the carbohydrate. It just doesn't give us the performance benefit because now you've switched off of our sort of secret weapon and our more efficient way of, of, of burning fuel, which is to try to have a better mixture and a more, higher mixture of fat burning. And so, and then when they looked at an Ironman specifically, they were shocked, they were completely shocked where basically the men did exactly what would be predicted. They had if the if the if the men were able to take in the nutrition, if they were able to take in the simple carbs during 
um, the, you know, the cycling in the run portion of the Ironman, it was directly proportional with their improved time because everybody was losing a lot of calories, right? I mean, it's a massive undertaking. But when they looked at the women, it, the opposite happened. If the women were taking in a lot of extra carbohydrate, their performance times were actually going down from, a, from a, in other words, the, t the end, the, their finishing time was going up, right? So, so it was a, it was a complete performance decrement for the women. Um, so I, I, I think I am not trying to say that, that glyco muscle glycogen is clearly really important for women. I think we have to put it on very slowly and differently, but, but the ability for us to sort of do a stopgap measure and say, okay, we can take in simple carbohydrates during exercise, which are, are known, you know, there's no dispute, they can improve performance. But it, with women, they don't seem to be able to have the same benefit. That's what I'm, in terms of a real strict performance indicator, they don't seem to have the same bang for the buck. Dina, when, um, you know, you, Kathy was just bringing up uh, Ironmans and, and you've worked with, you know, a number from ultra runners to triathletes, a number of of long course um, triathletes, how do you um, sort of go about manipulating the caloric intake so that folks are able to, you know, achieve both um, what they're looking for from a performance standpoint as well as from a body composition standpoint? Because that's certainly something that you know we'll, we'll, we'll dive into deeper here. But uh, you know, with endurance sports and running and triathlon, as it's you know really exploded and become so much more mainstream, uh, you know, over the uh, over the last several years, um, there's a lot of uh, newer athletes that are entering the sport, and, and a lot of folks that are that are entering the sport with a very specific body composition or, or weight loss goal in mind. So, um, how do you go about uh, manipulating someone's fuel intake uh, if they want to become more efficient? Uh, ideally, I will bring them into our performance lab so that I can connect the gal uh, to our metabolic cart and do some, some testing to see how, at rest, how are they using their fuel sources, get an idea of their resting metabolism, and then see what happens when they exercise, you know, bike or run. How do they currently, before I do any intervention, how are they using their energy sources? Um, because that will tell me, without me having to guess, I mean, I can look at diet logs and, and do um, some interviews and so forth, but um, having that actual data specific to the individual takes some of the guessing game out. Um, so it will tell me, you know, we've got uh, uh, an athlete who is more of a, a carb burner versus one who is more efficient at burning fat. Um, from there, then I know a better pathway as, as to how to overhaul meals. I'm not a proponent of, of calorie counting per se. Um, you know, I like to talk about real food and, you know, we eat, we eat real food, we don't eat calories type of approach um, and, and work to just optimize the daily nutrition and then certainly looking at calories needed before certain types of training sessions and, and periodizing that nutrition specific to the particular training for that particular also day, not only the day but the training block and all the way leading up to, to competition day. So when you talk about periodizing nutrition, um, can you just uh, expand just for folks that aren't familiar with, um, you know, what that means? What does periodizing your nutrition mean? So if we're talking, for example, for um, a triathlete who may have a race, let's say in the fall, is there a big um, half Ironman or Ironman distance race? Um, we can look at the training schedule sets or defined by the coach and typically we'll see two or three main cycles so a base training uh, a build you know some some higher intensity blocks of training so the coach works to design <clears throat> the athletes training schedule and you know nutrition should match what the athletes needs are for that particular training block so in a base period where a triathlete may be doing a lot of aerobic work, um, not a whole lot of high intensity work yet, there's no need to overdo it on calories, for example. You know, so we're trying to match nutrition to what the energy demands are for the particular female athlete. 
So it's it's kind of aligning nutrition with the training. Julie, you've um, you know you mentioned it at the beginning, but you've trained for everything from the 5K to the marathon, um, and so how do you sort of go about um, periodizing periodizing excuse me your nutrition when you're training for you know a shorter distance versus the the long haul in the marathon? Is there anything specific you look at in terms of you know carbohydrate, protein, and fat intake that changes um, you know based on those different uh, training blocks? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, if I reflect back on my, you know, my own consumption through different, you know, um, cycles of training and stuff, um, you know, it's interesting because my highest mileage as a 5K runner is about 85 miles a week. My highest mileage building up to a marathon is like about 100 miles a week. So 15 miles is, is not that big a difference. But when you're looking at it in terms of um, where those miles are spent, and uh, the different types of, of training that's involved in those. Um, there's definitely um, some different changes changes that I make. But, um, you know, nutritionally, I think, um, and I think this is where the gray area gets between um, being an athlete, between advising, and then between the science. Um, is is what is what does that all mean in practical terms? What does that mean when you wake up in the morning and you're trying to make choices for um, the specific uh, tasks that you have in each and every day? Um, maybe today's a lighter day versus a, a heavier day, um, and I think that's where it gets confusing for for athletes, for coaches. On, on how to actually apply that on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, when I when I'm doing a huge um, block of training and um, you know maybe higher mileage and a lot of aerobic work and double workouts a day, um, you know, for me obviously I, I focus on the types of foods that I take in on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things we try to work with our athletes on is is looking at food as fuel and associating it with fuel and less about um, what is, you know, the pleasure of the day or, or what um, um, is necessarily offered at the cafeteria that day. Um, and that doesn't always mean it's the most delicious choice to make at that time. But, um, you know, that's the thing that we really focus on with our athletes is, is food being fuel and then um, kind of an understanding that, you know, um, during different periods of training, they're going to need to be consuming um, more to kind of, of offset, um, you know, the, the energy output that they've had for that specific day. Um, and, and I do think that that can be really confusing for, for individuals. But I think for me, you know, always the rule of thumb is, um, is – Smaller meals throughout the day, um, making sure that I'm packing things ahead of time so that I don't ever get into a situation where I'm just grabbing something from the convenience store that's not going to be um, well processed in my system. Um, trying to cook at home, at home as much as possible and um, obviously focusing on some of those balances um, between carbohydrate, between protein intake, um, vegetables and, and sugars that, you know, come from fruits and things like that. So. You know, I think that if, if you're focusing on um, different periods of trading, there's definitely different um, changes that you would make. Um, but I do think that that's pretty specific to each individual athlete. And, um, you know, sometimes in these conversations it's difficult to, to describe because we have athletes processing food differently, um, metabolizing food differently. So, um, you know, I think athletes have to be responsible on some level to try to figure out what works best for them and and a lot of that comes from um, education and then you know um, definitely testing which was uh, was brought up with Dina and and then kind of having an understanding of their body makeup and how um, maybe a certain individual can consume a little bit more uh, carbohydrate and another individual has to focus on um, more more protein and fat intake and stuff like that so um, for me specifically, that does change throughout the cycle, um, and and I do definitely have to be aware of that as as I as I progress throughout the season. 
I think, Dino, one of the things that, that you have that, that is fascinating is, is that real look at the data. And I'm sure that when people come in um, to the facility and, and get the, uh, the metabolic efficiency test, you know, it, uh, oftentimes the, um, they can, I'm sure they can be very surprised by, by how much carbohydrate they might be burning um, compared to fat. Now, Kathy, I want to swing it um, back to you. Uh, you know, you, you often hear these phrases, um, you, you can't out-train bad nutrition or, you know, nutrition is... 75% exercise is 25%, you know, for people if they have a weight loss or a body composition goal, there, there's sort of different um, things that, that are ascribed to it. But but I think the, the overarching theme is that um, your pre and post workout nutrition when it comes to exercise is, is vital uh, in terms of making any uh, real gain. So let's just maybe um, start by talking about the pre workout period. What, what are important things? Um, when it comes to fueling a workout, um, you know, prior to a workout for women specifically to keep in mind based on how their bodies utilize different nutrients? Well, I, I think the, in, in, in my estimation, I think what, uh, what ends up happening is, is it depends on how far ahead you're talking about because, you know, what Julie is saying is that, you know, her strategy is to eat lots of little meals and part of that's going to digest easier and quicker, right, because they're small meals. And so part of it is if you're going to be doing speed, you, you know, there's only so much you can handle in your in your intestines at that time, right? So, I mean, she also mentioned you can and, and one of the beauties of it, it has that small metabolic footprint, if you will, in terms of not throwing everything off. So it's something that you can you know, have an hour before you work out and it's it's not going to um, invade how your body wants to do, to, to use that workout um, effectively from a physiological and metabolic standpoint. So I, I guess for, I think for women, the problem is we've probably been trying to do too much in terms of like <laughs> pre-exercise and that really for women, it's more like have they done their homework? And I think it's a really good time to bring up the fact that we we realize that there's a huge time lag. So if you've if you are starting to enter into a block of high um, say, say you know large volume training workouts for for a couple of weeks, the problem is is that your nutrition doesn't catch it. It doesn't match right away. So in a sense, you have to either already say, okay, I'm entering into this period and I've, I've got to already start to think about it, or, or you're going to be kind of behind before you've even entered your first week of training because you're not going to be eating to match up how much extra calories you've, you're starting to burn during that period. So I think I, I think for women, the, the real challenge is the fact that, one, we don't have the same flexibility as guys. We're not – our whole caloric allotment – is not as big. If you took cross-country skiers as a great example, right? For those guys, they're up in the 5,000s of calories. We're still down in the 3,000s of calories per day. We're just, it's just, even though that's massive whole body, you know, massive exercise, um, it's, a, it's a great example of still the major difference in terms of the, the total energy expenditure that we can maintain as women. So it's, it's I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of practical I think there's a lot of practicality to it for on an individual basis, but I th but I think to a certain extent I think women it, we ha we already have our fuel set as long as we've been you know making sure that the glycogen is there and if we're it, because we have the fat let's face it so it's it's more about eating healthy and and making sure we stay healthy from an immune system and everything else and not trying to get in the way of our bodies. <laughs> If that makes any sense. Absolutely. And when you say when when you say get in the way of, of your bodies, um, you know, I, I think it's a great point and, and it might be helpful to like, what does that mean? You know, what what gets in the way um, of, of, you know, the fat burning potential and, and what women are naturally um, biologically good at? What types of things get in the way of that? Well, if you've if you've just eaten a large meal of pasta, say, or something that that has a lot of a high glycemic index, you are going to have an insulin response, which means that your fat cells are going to are going to want to take up nutrients. They're not going to want to give out the fatty acids that we need. And the the problem we know with women is is that 
we're really efficient at storing. So the minute we have insulin, things are going to shut down. And that's true for pretty much every, the men and women. But I think that the, the key is that women, we tend to, 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 to um, s exist at a lower level of circulating fat anyway. And so, and if, but it's that circulating fat that's going to feed the fat burn. And so if, if, you know, that's best if it's coming from our fat cells. So it's, it's, if you shut that down because you've just eaten a lot of carbohydrate, you can't tap into that because it's not going to come back online until you've cleared the carbohydrate out of your body. So, and it turns out of your blood. So it, it, you know, you could see it ebb and flow. So it takes another, you know, hour, 90 minutes, depending on how insulin resistant you are, it's going to take a while to, to, to put the insulin back, you know, bring the insulin back down again. So what you've eaten before your workout, as I said, if, you, if a woman takes in a lot of carbohydrate, just like a guy, they're going to burn those, that carbohydrate. They're not going to tap into their endogenous stores of fat at all during that workout, pretty much. So it's, it's, you can work against your body's natural, you know, magic, you know, magic weapon there. So Dina, you know, people might hear what Kathy's saying and, and suddenly, uh, you know, for folks that are, uh, that have kind of been traditionally schooled or, 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 or you know, might, might read what's uh, some of what's out there in, in the mainstream, uh, you know, they're, they're used to having things like, you know, bagels or, or you know, sugar-based sports drinks or gels uh, prior to, to a workout to fuel them. But, you know, as, as Kathy's um, expanded upon, the research is telling us that that's not the ideal way to do things, um, you know, to take advantage of. Um, of your fat burning ability. And, and, you know, Kathy, one thing that you, you pointed out to before is that, you know, fat burning shouldn't just be viewed at, um, in the lens of fitness. Um, but it, it should also be viewed at, at, in the lens of performance because fat's an incredibly, uh, abundant and powerful fuel source, especially in women, uh, as you've as you said, you know, a, a number of times here. Um, so Dina, you know, traditionally speaking, when, when people have thought about teaching themselves to burn more fat, you know, we've thought about, um, you know, kind of that, um, that long period of aerobic training, uh, that slow and steady training, if you will, to, to stimulate and, and get your body to rely more on fat. But, but what you're really doing is showing people how to do this through um, nutrition manipula uh, manipulation. And you're finding that people are actually also able to burn fats, not only just at that kind of slow and steady pace, but also at higher intensities. So um, maybe, I don't know if there's really a question in there, but um, how are you recommending people use their nutrition to to manipulate that fat burning rather than that the type of workout being specific to burning more fat? Okay, yeah, I think it does still come back to putting together those meals that really keep our blood sugar levels as stable as possible. And so that is that, you know, when we talk about real, like, it's those mixed meals that um, are really controlled in their carbohydrate content. So we're not saying, you know, no carbohydrates. It's more let's choose the quality sources of carbohydrates, your vegetables, your fruits, you know, nuts, seeds, avocados, even foods that, that some of us tend to think are not carb-containing, like those nuts and seeds and avocados. Um, keeping those foods high-quality those carb sources, and then looking to include um, proteins and fats in the right amounts. Um, and one thing I wanted to add to what Kathy had said earlier, as far as women being a little different, I, I still get reports or questions from from female athletes who read um, some old older sports nutrition guidelines, whether it's in books, magazines, or on the internet that say, you know, eat 500 calories before you begin your workout, no matter what your workout is. And, you know, a lot of that came from studies in men, and besides the fact that it's old now, but it doesn't talk about the type of calories either. And so that, you know, 250-calorie bagel is is the type of carbohydrate that will spike blood sugar, lead to an insulin rise, which is really not what we want to do when we're heading into an exercise session because it does turn down that body's ability to really pull from fat or use fatty acids as a fuel source more efficiently. How, when, when people come in and, and you're kind of, you know, what you just said is you have athletes reading 
kind of the older research, uh, I mean, how shocking can this be to, to folks when you're kind of uh, turning the world upside down in a way? You know, we've, we've, I, I think that the bagel, the, the bagel and the banana before exercise is almost just such a classic runner endurance athlete meal. You see it everywhere. You see it at races. Um, so how is this generally greeted when you're presenting it to people? <laughs> After they're done throwing things at me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a new paradigm shift. I mean, we're still talking about fueling the athlete. And as Julie said, you know, thinking of food as fuel, but it's different food now, you know, and um, we're still trying to be mindful. And, and I think here as a sports dietitian, this is where some of the examination of habits comes into play and lifestyle because some of those classic foods like the bagel banana combination are easy that perception those are my easy go-to foods I don't have to cook them or prep them and so there's some um, barrier there immediately just the thought of oh what do you mean I have to cook a whole bunch of other food now instead of my bagel banana and so that's just really a teaching opportunity to to gather um, athletes food preferences and work with them and, and explain it, it doesn't need to be a fancy process per se you know we can still find those simple foods but we're changing the ratio of the carbs and the proteins and fats now to keep blood sugar stable keep you well nourished pay attention to the micronutrients you know all those issues that that we want to pay attention to not only for um, athletic performance, but for health as well. And that's the key. Yeah. Are you? Can, can you? Can you? Can you possibly give um, some of our viewers an example of of the type of of foods, like you know, the actual foods themselves that you would recommend? Um, you know, not necessarily the amount of it, because that would really depend on on the type of of exercise that's to follow, but. Um, when you're speaking of those foods, can you give recommendations of, yeah. of ideas for some ideas? Yeah, gosh, you know, an easy one I, I like to include because I personally do this often is um, smoothies. <clears throat> because smoothies, you know, you can make the night before. Um, they're so flexible in terms of the ingredients. So we might have a protein powder, which could be. A plant protein powder or a whey protein powder or egg white powder and, and then you excuse me want to add in some some carbohydrate there and the amount or the type might vary but that could be berries it could be chia seeds or um, a little bit of a, a yogurt um, something along those lines and then ideally we sneak in a little bit of a fat so that we've got all of our bases covered here um, in terms of that stable blood sugar control so that fat source can be coconut milk or coconut butter coconut flakes um, you know peanut butter um, even avocado is another option um, of course you can is also another carb source that can be included for a variety of delicious recipes um, but that's a real easy one and you know convenient for a lot of athletes and then of course we've got things like um, hard-boiled eggs you can grab and go with a piece of fruit um, or maybe you've made a batch of a you know a frittata with eggs and vegetables and some avocado you know again we have to look at tolerance in terms of of the gut how well some of these foods will work um, and timing of a workout session thereafter. Um, so those are a couple ideas, but um, yogurt is another popular one, finding a good quality source of yogurt, um, low, relatively low sugar, and, and bulk it up with a bunch of goodies, um, seeds and, and mashing in different things, hemp hearts or chia seeds, um, berries, I mean, just endless combinations. Does that help? Yes, thank you <laughs> very much. Yeah, Julie, you were Varun, can I add a yeah. can I add a comment here too? Yeah. Because you know, Julie mentioned age at the beginning too. You know, she said that things have changed as she's um, gotten a little bit older, um, past collegiate, and in what she can tolerate. And I think this is a really good time to bring up the fact that 
you know, if, you know, athletes can also get away with a lot more than a recreational exerciser can because, you know, not necessarily in terms of tolerance, you know, they may have a finer tolerance for what their belly wants to handle, <laughs> but in terms of their, their blood sugar stability and what they can eat, particularly, a, you know, a, a young athlete can often, they, they can probably eat that bagel and banana and get out there and have a stable blood sugar because they clear it so fast. They're so insulin sensitive. So I think we don't want to also take, you know, it's, it's good to, to make sure that people realize that the fitter people are, also, sugar doesn't matter as much, right? So, so they, it's it's okay, right? <laughs> so, so there's lots of carbs. And part of it is is where you are in the spectrum of how much you're training, and also, like how old you are, and all these other kinds of things. Because if, if you were to look at the data between somebody who's just sort of recreational or sedentary, and they would eat the same bagel and banana as somebody who's an athlete. I mean, the, the blood sugar almost doesn't go up and the insulin almost doesn't go up in the athlete, right? So so there is a huge, huge difference in terms of flexibility, the fitter you are, just in terms of an impetus to, to be fit and <laughs> gives you much more flexibility. And that's true for men and women. <laughs> and I agree on that, except my, my concern or what I see too is just those habits that form through the decades. Yes. And then, you know, when I'm 45 or I get into, and I'm still doing the same things, I, it does catch up with you. As you're alluding to, I mean, at some point, um, unless you are, are very active throughout and maintain muscle mass appropriately, things change, especially for women. Yeah. No, I don't mean to. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a really important point. I just wanted to make the point that in reality, right at certain times, there is a difference in the physiology and the metabolism too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting? I have a question what, for yeah, both you... of you guys. Sorry, Go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to hop in again. No <laughs> problem. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I would like to know from both um, Gina and Kathy, you know, if, if we have individuals who are listening tonight and they say to themselves, this, in, this information that we're hearing tonight is incredible, how does it apply to me? Um, a lot of what we're talking about here is individual kind of chemical makeup, hormonal makeup, um, our ability to burn fat. And, um, you know, do you guys have recommendations for someone who might be curious and kind of wanting to know what their particular roadmap looks like? Um, you know, is that blood testing? Um, is that um, kind of VO2 max testing? Like, what, what does that look like in your world? And if, if people are really invested in trying to figure out, um, you know, how efficient their body is, um, how would they go about doing that? Do you want to start, Kathy? Well, uh, yeah, I, I could start. I mean, I think one of the things is that a lot of, like, say you're at a university, there's a lot of, of um, universities that have exercise labs, and exercise labs are, are terrific places um, that often run studies, they often do things with athletes, which is fantastic. Um, some of them have services where you can get tested, but it's, it's, one of the things that would be good to know is that you can get on a metabolic heart. You know, you, you have to do with breath, and, but breath is breath. It's just, it's easy, right? So in a, in a sense, if you can have access to a metabolic heart and, and can have somebody r run a test on you, even doing some of these incremental tests that don't take very long, but show you how, what you're burning percent-wise sort of between carbohydrate and fat as you increase intensity can give you a sense. Are you really a fat burner? Are you not a fat burner? Are you, you know, could, can I make a change and, and, and better utilize that? I mean, most athletes, if they've been at it a while, they've had the adaptations to make themselves fat burning. But if, again, this is partly nutrition, if they always go out and and drink Gatorade during their run, their body never has to adapt to burning fat. So the idea that you have to, um, you know, you have the genetic capability, you know, who, who are you and what are you training for, but also if you can, if you can tap into local resources like a university that, that's doing a study or that maybe they have a service where you can, can actually be tested, that's the best way, obviously, because then you can get a sense for you know, where are you on the spectrum? Are you somebody that really burns fat well, or are you somebody that tends to be a, you know, a carbohydrate person? So these are all uh, yeah, I, I, 
important perspective um, to bring in. And, and I know we're, we're a little uh, up against the clock here, but one kind of more broader issue that I wanted to tackle, and perhaps you could start with this, Dina, is that, um, you know, at about maybe two questions ago, at the very end of your statement, you um, you know, kind of highlighted, um, you know, that there's the performance aspect, but there's also the health aspect. And, you know, a lot of people who are, who are doing these sports, um, you know, are in it for health purposes. So when we're looking at the, um, you know, the broader issue of, of weight loss, um, you know, and, and general health, um, how does this all, you know, how, how does this all fit in um, when, when an athlete comes to you and, uh, you know, they, they may have like a, a goal, they want to do a certain race, but, but they're also kind of looking to get their health in gear and, and, and drop some weight, you know, I, how do you generally like to um, approach fueling with them in, in that case? Um, I mean, I, I do like to look at health and, and blood work, as Julie was asking. I mean, that's a great starting point just to see where we're at, um, health markers. The testing, of course, as Kathy was saying, is great. That's something I do as well. I mean, those are ideal, right, to, to look inside the body and have those um, the data points. The assessment that I do... Um, as far as daily nutrition is is really my next stopping point or starting point, I guess. Um, looking at again lifestyle, I mean, considering even things like sleep, um, stress levels, all those things can affect body weight. It's not just the food we eat. And so, um, although I'm not a therapist by any means, but I mean that can definitely highlight some areas in a woman's life that need to be addressed outside of my realm. Um, but food-wise, I certainly like to look at, um, you know, the types of foods being consumed, amounts, the reasons why the female athlete is eating. So is it because of hunger and is that a true hunger or is that a emotional hunger? Um, you know, really trying to pinpoint and get at, you know, what are the reasons we're eating and what is on that plate of food and, and trying to optimize along with just collecting things like how are you feeling after you eat that particular meal and how does it affect your mood and your sleep and so on. And I know that's kind of broad, but... No, that's, that's great. When you talk about emotional hunger, um, you, you know, how much of emotional hunger is tied into uh, fluctuations um, and highs and lows in, in your blood sugar? I mean, I see... I see that play a pretty big role for <laughs> for a lot of a lot of women. Um, you know, eating out of emotional stress or, or even boredom can often lead to eating those those sweets or, or sugary foods, and that's what sets us off on that roller coaster of highs and lows. And I feel great, and the next minute I feel sluggish because that was a, a big bowl of candy or whatever it is that, that really didn't provide much in the way of nourishment or that stability in terms of blood sugar control. So it can make a huge difference. So with, I, I want to get, um, uh, you, you know, we have a lot of questions, of course, um, and I didn't want to make this so much about uh, UCAN specifically, because I think you guys have a ton of uh, a fantastic perspective, um, you know, on, on the newer research and, and all the folks that you've worked with uh, to offer. But um, we, we do have a lot of questions about UCAN. So I, I want to just take a quick um, roundtable and ask you guys each, um, you know, one or two things kind of specifically pertaining to you about UCAN. But, um, you know, really quickly, I'll just take a, about a minute or two uh, to, to really highlight what's unique about UCAN. And, and that really, you know, we've talked a lot about carbohydrates and the quality of carbohydrates and blood sugar control today. And that's really what the crux um, of UCAN is and what makes it so unique. So um, our carbohydrate, which we call super starch, um, was actually developed originally for our founder's son, Jonah. He has um, life-threatening hypoglycemia, which is uh, low blood sugar or low energy. And previously, Jonah was being fed every two hours um, throughout the day just to keep his blood sugar and his energy steady. Um, wasn't a, a you know, very uh, easy lifestyle for his parents waking up every two hours to feed their child. If they didn't do it, uh, it could result in life-threatening seizures for Jonah. So in 2000, Jonah's family started a foundation and they were basically looking um, at all different types of carbohydrates. And they were looking for something that would essentially 
stabilize blood sugar or, or burn slowly um, throughout the night to, to keep their son's blood sugar and energy steady throughout the night so he didn't have to wake up and be fed. And this is where super starch came about. This is where super starch was discovered. And um, really all super starch is, the starting ingredient is non-GMO corn. It's cooked with heat and water. And the way it's cooked actually slows the breakdown and slows the release of the carbohydrates. So, so what does that mean, um, you know, nuts and bolts? Um, it, it really means two things. Um, by slowing the release of the carbohydrate, it allows it to maintain that steady level of energy for a lot longer. So when Dina was saying, you know, uh, earlier, like 250 calories of, uh, of a bagel isn't the same as 250 calories of something else, that's really what we're seeing with UCAN. Um, you know, 100 calories or 120 calories of UCAN is able to maintain your blood sugar and energy for about 90 minutes to two hours um, during exercise. Whereas, you know, 100 calories or 120 calories in the form of simple sugar, which that's what you'll find in a typical gel product. And that's going to give you that that up and down uh, in your blood sugar and your energy, you know, within about 20 to, to 40 minutes. Um, that's why you take a gel every, um, you know, every half an hour or so. Um, so that's really what the uniqueness of UCAN is. And, and for, for from a women's standpoint, you know, when, when Kathy's talking about, um, you know, that ability to make your calories count. That's really what UCAN's promoting. It's promoting calorie efficiency, and, it, and, and it's giving you a carbohydrate source that's going to maintain that steady level of blood sugar, but because it's not going to spike that hormone insulin, which Kathy was talking about, you know, insulin's a hormone that it's going to really limit your ability to burn fat with, uh, with your traditional simple carbohydrates. When you get that sugar spike, you get a corresponding spike in insulin, and you're not burning fat to your full potential. But with UCAN, you're getting that nice, slow, and steady release. Um, and it's keeping your blood sugar steady, it's keeping your insulin low, and it's allowing you to freely burn fat throughout exercise. So I always like to say for the endurance athlete, you know, the beauty of UCAN is it bridges that gap between maintaining that steady level of energy for a long period of time, but doing so without sacrificing your fitness and without putting a lot of simple calories on board. So Kathy, uh, starting with you, you know, what was it that intrigued you about um, you can, and, and how, what, what benefit, how, how have you found, um, that it could be, uh, really beneficial, um, you know, kind of for the general population? Well, I, I think it's, it's just what you were saying that it has a, it has a very small footprint. So it's not, it's, it's one of these accessory tools that can be used in different ways. I mean, there's even data right now that suggests that say you wanted you were somebody that wants to sort of lose a few pounds and you want to, and women should do this in a real stealth way so that they don't start to rebound and put it back on again. Well, they're suggesting that you can, you can do something even just at lunchtime and you can kind of fool your body. So this is something, say, say you're going to work out later in the day or say you worked out in the morning and you've already had a snack. They figured out that even if people just ate what they normally eat, and then replace and only have a small lunch that's basically like a low glycemic index thing, like you, like you can, right? You, they don't ever put those calories back to, into their diet. So, and that's pretty incredible. So, if you could keep your blood sugar stable, because we know that people get instantly hungry if their blood sugar starts to precipitously go down. And so if, if you can keep your blood sugar stable, you have the possibility of a tool that can, can just make you comfortable for more hours of the day and just with this small metabolic footprint so you can eat healthfully. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't interfere with what you want to do. It doesn't interfere with how you are doing your workout and it doesn't interfere, it doesn't interfere with how you want to progress with your nutritional strategy. I think what you said is a great way to think of it, of being uh, thinking of it as a tool to stabilize your blood sugar. You know, Dina, uh, you had talked about, um, you know, uh, different ways to, uh, when we were, Julie was asking about kind of uh, good things uh, to eat pre-workout. You know, you talked about a lot of uh, smoothies that could stabilize your blood sugar. You mentioned you can, and, and that's really one way to look at it is that you can can be another tool in your belt to stabilize blood sugar. So some days you might say, you know, I'm going to make a, a well-balanced smoothie. Other days you might be trying to exercise, uh, you know, straight from work and might not have that luxury. So, um, you know, whatever way you're choosing to keep your blood sugar steady, it's, it's uh, as we've talked about at Lent today, it's always going to be a benefit. Um, but Dina, um, you know, I know that, that you've uh, got to run and I, I know I've kept you about a couple minutes longer than promised. We'll, we'll get you out on this. Um, you've worked with a, a host of endurance athletes. Um, you've you're also an endurance athlete yourself. You've done some pretty grueling um, 
uh, ultra running events yourself. Uh, I don't want to get that overshadowed. Quite an impressive athlete as well. Um, what have you found, um, you know, to be most, um, I guess, fascinating about UCAN and the way it's benefited uh, either you personally or, or the folks that you've worked with? I think a large number of the the people I work with and and that goes across, you know, men and women, and me personally, is the ease of use and the surprising fact that this little bit of powder <laughs> that you can mix in water in a small amount can, can last so long and not cause so much in the way of energy fluctuations or um, stomach or, or gastrointestinal distress. Those are the, the highlights. And for me, you know, being out for... 25 plus hours on a for a race I mean that's huge and can make or break a race I mean nutrition's in my opinion um, still undervalued by a number of endurance athletes and so um, they often come to me when when there are struggles and so at that point you know finding a, a formula like this can be life-changing and it can make for better athletic success down the road and, you know, Dina, you and your colleague, uh, Bob Sibahar, uh, out in uh, Colorado, um, you know, you guys just have a number of, uh, you, you can check it out, um, uh, I'm sure, uh, via their website, Energy Performance, um, e, and I'm going to actually post that in the chat here in a moment. But you, you guys have a number of fascinating stories where we're athletes who are, you know, used to consuming 300 to 400 calories an hour, uh, but really have struggled uh, from a GI standpoint, uh, the, you know, with, with stomach issues doing so. Um, have come to you, trained with you, and, and, you know, cut those calories down for Ironman races or ultra uh, running races, you know, in the 100 range or, or even below 100 calories an hour just by practicing metabolic efficiency uh, and getting their body uh, better uh, trained to utilize fat uh, as well as implementing you can. Um, I mean, how drastic have the changes you've seen uh, with some of the, uh, you know, the women athletes you've worked with been? Pretty pretty extreme in some cases. I mean, I've got a couple gals even in their 60s who have been doing um, long course triathlons, who are Ironman races, and, um, you know, they've, they've had kids and grandkids and, and new to triathlon, but, you know, working with trying to improve metabolic efficiency and working on that improvement in fat burning and and dietary changes through daily nutrition has been significant in terms of um, improving lean body mass, reducing body fat, uh, health parameters improving, and so all of that translates to you know better outcomes when trying to do these long distance sports or long <laughs> long duration sports. And so that's huge. And then the whole thing about figuring out the sports nutrition needs, um, again, that spans the, the decades of life, but, but people who had suffered thinking that they had to consume three or 400 calories per hour and, and suffering or not finishing their races due to stomach issues or, or whatnot, I mean, that, that's easily fixed through uh, motivation and, and just some dedication to looking at nutrition patterns and a product like you can has changed, changed athletes lives for sure. Julie, I remember uh, 2012, spring of 2012, sitting with you at uh, Starbucks, I think in, uh, in Manhattan and uh, chatting about uh, some of this. And that, that was right around the time where, uh, you know, prior to making the Olympic team where you were really starting to, uh, implement you can more and more into your training. Um, what was your motivation for looking at something different? Um, and w what benefit have you seen? How have you implemented and what benefit have you seen? Yeah, in 2012, I think, um, you know, probably 2011 leading into 2012 is where I was really starting to implement you can into um, my daily or every other day at a minimum. Um, you know, workout routine and, and nutrition uh, routine. And, um, you know, I think you can, for me, other than all of the benefits that we've talked about tonight, the way it affects your, your body and your digestive system and your sugar, your, uh, your glucose levels and, um, you know, spikes in insulin and, and then uh, everything else. I mean, you can 
in the simplest terms and in the way that I've uh, I've used it and approached it in my training is is just like there's just ease of mind using it. Um, I don't have to worry about if I'm going to have the the, um, energy levels at the end of a workout when I'm using Ginger Planner. And I don't have to worry about um, if I can go to the gym right after a, you know, hour and a half run, um, if I have a, a small shake in between. Um, there's just, in a, in a, it has changed the way that um, I approach my training because I can take on larger blocks um, in, in, a, in a daily routine, um, just, just having that on hand. So um, I think particularly 2011, 2012, any questions that I ever really had about, okay, I've got a hard workout this morning, like how am I going to approach it nutritionally? Like I never approach a single workout without Generation you can being a part of that. Um, and so it never, I, I never was thinking, you know, mid-workout, am I going to feel the way I need to feel at the end of it? Um, am I going to be able to um, have a, a second session after this? Like, how is this going to affect my performance for today? How is it going to affect my, or affect my performance when I line up um, on the starting line that weekend? And, um, you know, you may not feel it in some of the, the shorter distances and things, but, you know, even with some of the athletes I advise, um, if they're 400-meter athletes, 800-meter athletes uh, um, in kind of that shorter to middle distance range, I talk to them about, you know, you might be working out outside for, for a long period of time or you might have a, a, a speed session and then immediately go inside and work in the weight room, and, and this is the type of product that, um, when you're getting to those last couple intervals, you're not going to feel that energy level difference that you, you know, you might have felt before. Um, one of the things that I really loved about it was, uh, especially in long runs, um, I could feel the same way in the first few minutes of the run that I did in the last few minutes of the run. And that was a really powerful thing because I left all of those particular um, effort feeling like really positive and I got something out of it. Um, you know, we, we talk about the way it physically affects our body, but, um, the other, the other aspect of that is like how it, um, mentally and emotionally affects your body. If you leave a workout, um, feeling like you could have given more or you didn't have to go so far, um, um, deep into your system to pull something out. Um, I think having that nutritional capacity is, is, such a, a leader into your ability to really build momentum um, when you're training or, or competing. So, I mean, I, without sounding cheesy, I can't kind of, I, I really can't, um, you know, thank this this product enough for the for the changes that it's made in my ability to kind of get the most out of myself, um, both in training and competition. That's fantastic, Julie. That's a, gr- a great perspective. And, and I think, um, you know, in, in wrapping this up, Kathy, I want to take it back to you because, um, you know, I, I keep coming back to this idea that, that uh, you know, we've talked this entire time about the, the and I really highlighted, I hope, the importance of, of managing your blood sugar, um, you know, for, for everybody really, but specifically for women and, um, you know, and, and you can being the tool to do that. Um, but, Kathy, this is putting a lot of pressure on you, maybe. But if we've, uh, you know, we, we've been at this for a little bit over an hour, and, and you know, gone in a, a number of different directions, and certainly I'm leaving this saying I could have spent another two hours with all you guys, just just some fantastic information. But what what would you say, you know, maybe two or three things that people could take away from this session? Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, women athletes um, that are that are on this webinar. What are, what are a couple things that? Um, you know, they should really stick in their mind um, that that might run counter to what they're reading or, or have heard um, in the mainstream. Well, I think I think one is that they they have a lot of capacity already, and I think they have to sort of get out of their own way. <laughs> I think they have to fuel like to, to stay more with homeostasis, so to stay even. So, so when you're when you're fueling, think about it as having good nutrition on top of 
you know, what are you going to be doing over the next several days? Because there is a time lag. So, so think about the nutrition as it as it's happening more in terms of blocks, just like you train in blocks, just like what Dina is saying for periodization. I think I think th there is really something to be said for the fact that women probably have to pay attention to that even even more simply because we don't have as many calories to play with. We don't have as much flexibility. But I, I, I think you have to, I, I think it's one of those things that you can, you, you do have to sort of see what works, right? So to me, I, I just think time and time again from the literature, it's looking like women really do have a good ability to burn fat during exercise. And when we're not exercising, it's not so easy. And so we, we go into storage mode. We're very metabolically efficient in that way in terms of storage. So, so you sort of have to be active throughout the day. If you're, and, and if you're an athlete, you want to make sure that you make those workouts count and, you, and you, you bring to the table what you can do to make that happen. And to me, that means like something like you can, something, something that's going to that's gonna allow you to sort of get out of the way <laughs> of your own workout. <laughs> So that's that's the way I sort of think about it. Well, that's fantastic. Um, Kathy, Julie, uh, Dina, I know Dina had to step off, but um, I, I really appreciate you guys sharing your insight. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here busily scratching away at the notepad uh, with some of the stuff you guys said because it's just it's just really insightful and valuable. And I know, um, you know, based on the comments and the questions, folks in the audience uh, really appreciate it as well. Julie, I want to give you a chance if uh, there's anything you wanted to add or that we might, um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot we didn't cover. We'll have to do this again sometime, but um, anything that you wanted to cover particular to, uh, particularly today, I just want to give you the floor. No, I, I think the, the last thing I would like to say um, is, you know, to the women or, or men that are listening, you know, to, to this webinar this evening, um, I, I really think it's important, you know, a, to listen to things like this, to, to webinars like this, um, to really pay attention to um, the research and the information and, and then really kind of um, take what you know and what you've learned and what you've read and apply it to your own life. You know, I think that's, um, you know, if you're incapable of, of, of having some of that blood work done or, or doing some of that testing and things like that is, is really just kind of... Um, you know, taking it in your own hands to find, okay, what works and what doesn't work, um, you know, when it comes to nutrition and performance and things like that, because, you know, as we found, you know, we all have very different chemical makeups, and I think the biggest thing that we really can do to kind of honor, you know, the body that we've been given is, is to kind of explore that for ourselves and, um, you know, take the time in our life to, to find out what works for us and what doesn't work for us, and um, ultimately how that affects our performance and our ability to, to really um, to really get the most out of ourselves. Dina, I don't know if you're still on with us. I know you sent me a message saying you, you wanted to catch every last tidbit. Uh, if you are with us, anything um, I'm you'd like to add? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll give you the final you know, here, Dina. A anything uh, that we didn't cover or anything that you wanted to, to add before we sign off? Well, I mean, I, I feel like there is still another good hour of information to share, <laughs> but to just follow on from what Julie was saying, um, I, I mean, us gals, we are worth, we are worth it. And, and so I feel in my work, a lot of um, women athletes will come to me and they're just not sure about even the services I offer, which really is, is just, you know, looking at nutrition and, and sports nutrition and health. Um, but being shy about prioritizing themselves in this whole realm. And so I, no matter what kind of athlete we are or you are, um, it's still worth pursuing, you know, improving health, improving performance by whatever measures you can. And so I just wanted to say, you know, we're, we're worth it, so don't be shy. That's a great message uh, to leave to, to leave this on. So uh, I, I want to thank everybody again. Really thank Kathy, Dina, and Julie for uh, your time tonight, for your insight. I uh, want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, do stay tuned to your email for uh, a very special offer um, and a full recording of the webinar. You'll be getting that here in the next um, couple hours. So for those of you that 
want to re-listen to this or, or didn't have a chance to catch the whole thing, the, uh, the full replay will be uh, made available to you along with the special offer by email a little bit later tonight. Um, you can catch Julie, uh, I guess, on Twitter. Um, is it, what is it, Julie? Is it at Julie Culley? Yeah, pretty simple. <laughs> uh, pretty simple. I'll put that in the chat. Um, I know Dina is on Twitter as well. She's uh, Dina at Dina Griffin RD. Um, and you can also check out her website, which I'm posting in the chat. It's Energy Performance. Dot com. Again, they're out in uh, Colorado and uh, doing a lot of really uh, great things with uh, metabolic testing and, and a whole host of other nutrition services. Kathy, um, I don't know. Do we need to get you a Twitter account? Are you, uh, are you, on, are you on social media? <laughs> I don't want to leave you yeah, out. I'll just back up these ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can, uh, you can catch Kathy uh, roaming the streets of uh, downtown New Haven. So <laughs> that's the best way to find her. But, but really, uh, thank you guys so much again for joining us tonight. And um, you will be getting a follow-up email from me. If there's any questions we weren't able to answer, please shoot them my way. I've got these, uh, you know, these really uh, uh, intelligent folks um, at my disposal. So I could certainly kick some questions uh, their way. Thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate it. Kathy, Dina, Julie, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Boren Shreer. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much.